So without further ado, let's go over to Preston Nichols. Preston, are you there? I think I'm here. Or is this a bad dream? <laughs> well, I hope it's not a or bad dream. Or it's a good dream. <laughs> I hope it's a good dream. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, I'm here. Okay, so well... Dale Cujo is here, too. Oh, well, that's very nice. My dog, Cody, is here. So we've got dogs and, and people and all kinds of things listening, I'm sure. Um, as well tons as being... and tons of radio equipment. <laughs> okay, very cool. Uh, so what I want to do is, is have you introduce yourself in whatever way you see fit. Um, I, I have read uh, the Montauk books, some of which you co-wrote with Peter Moon. And uh, I, I don't know what else uh, you've got out there, but uh, you're certainly welcome to, to let people know if you've got anything new going on. But, but basically introduce yourself, maybe tell a little bit of your history. Well, basically I'm an engineer and a physicist. I have a S degree in electrical technology. I have a bachelor's degree in uh, electronics engineering, I have a master's degree in electrophysics and a PhD in quantum electrodynamics, which is quantum electronics. My hobbies are music and uh, paranormal stuff. So that's basically my interest. I'm born in 1946, May 24th, which means I'll be 66 years old in a few days. And I actually made 66 years of age, it looks like. And I grew up in East Islip, Long Island, New York, in Suffering County. Montauk is in Suffering County. That's actually Suffolk County. We call it Suffering County. I moved up to Green County here, which is 30 miles south of Albany, and 100 miles north of New York City in a town called Cairo, like Cairo, Egypt, but they say Cairo up here. And I bought two dilapidated ramshackle old houses and filled them with electronic equipment and radio equipment. I'm basically an audio engineer. I've had experience in the rock recording business, but mostly of the 60s and the early 70s. And, uh, you know, I design and build audio systems. I have what I call the big noisy sound system based upon vacuum tubes which go into the paranormal realms, you know, the quantum aspects of the voltages between the grids and the plate of the tubes allow you to couple into at least seven parallel realities through basically the effect of electrons and photons being both particles and waves. And this allows you, the equipment to sample your fields and cross your fields with the music's fields and make something, you know, project a field that you can literally sink right into. And, uh, you know, it's full fidelity. You know, I have four big vacuum tube amplifiers and about six big solid state amplifiers for the bass. And I recently added torsion fields to it, quite by accident. And I'm still working at the physics of the torsion fields, coupling into the see this system. You lay on a lounge in the middle of the room, and it recreates three-dimensional sound images around you, as well as coupling your mind into other realities. But I added a bed that has a rotary shaker in it, you know, a vibrator. Not the kind that most people think of. It's a motor with an offset weight, and it vibrates at 10 hertz, which, of course, is one of the master healing frequencies. But what I discovered, by shaking the whole bed, I have a system that couples the bass response right into the bed or the lounge. So as you're laying there, you feel the bass as well as hearing it. You know, you only hear down to about 30 hertz, everything else you feel. And I've come across some sort of torsion amplification effect. And, you know, in, uh, you know, health and paranormal, there's a lot of chatter right now about torsion fields. And, of course, I've done experimentation with gyroscopes that uh, generate torsion fields. And basically, it's a vortexual field that is being generated. 
Uh, that's well, what I'm up to right now. Wow, and um, that's fascinating, Preston. Uh, let me let me actually ask you if you will go back in history and talk a little bit about the Montauk project, and 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 then let's come forward and and talk about what you're doing now because that sounds really absolutely incredible. Um, but I am curious, if, you know, to hear from you directly in terms of your experience with the Montauk project and and how you got involved in it and what your perspective is of it now. Well, basically. I went to work in a military industrial company. I found I was actually working for the government, and I got assigned to this wacko crazy project that was being done first to Brookhaven National Labs and then to Montour Point. And uh, I guess they found my but interest to be very interesting, which is technical electronics and paranormal and paranormal. Uh, he dropped off for some reason. Okay, well. <laughs> uh, I'll try. I'll call him right back. We were just going to get to the good part, huh? Okay, well, that's typical. Uh, <laughs> so everyone, just be patient with this process. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll we will be able to get him back on the line. Obviously. You know the powers that we have to fool around with this shit. So um, sorry, I guess I'm not supposed to say that on the world, on the radio. But what the hell? Uh, <laughs> so anyway, um, so are we dialing him? How's it going? Uh, yeah, I just redialed him, and it's busy now. Wow. Okay. Well, I'll do it again. <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, we're we're. Well, how this is interesting. Preston? I haven't been able to get him yet. Hello? Okay, well, we're, we're, we're still trying, uh, and we've got some strange interference going on. <laughs> Wild and crazy, as usual. Uh, well, you know, somebody who is creating uh, torsion fields in his living room and, and, and putting you in an altered universe, uh, I guess they, they might be a little concerned about that. Um, and he says it, it, it was such, uh, such, in such a calm way. And, uh, and, and, and it's, it's, it's absolutely mind-boggling. See if we can get him here. Hello? Hello? Hi, Preston. <laughs> yeah, I guess the powers of be don't want you to hear about this. I guess not. Wow, that was very interesting. So well, it could let's... be related to the uh, solar storm. Okay, well, let's. Uh, I'll take it either way, but let's see if we can make our way through this. Uh, you were about to say that, that you got involved in this government project, and what exactly was your role back in those days? I was basically an engineer. My... I was working on the radio frequency equipment, and I was modifying the old radar transmitters and stuff for the project. See, what Montauk Project was was basically a mind amplifier. It had an input network we called the Montauk Chair that a depth psychic would lay in and go into a trance, and uh, <clears throat> then the chair had the capability of picking a thought. Now, in the trance, he would concentrate on one thing. So you get a coherent thought. It will go into the computers, be aligned and corrected and you know made broadcastable, and then was broadcast out a very high-powered radar transmitter operating at 435 megahertz, which has something to do with a molecular resonance of water. Of course, human beings are made up of mostly water, you know, we're all wet. My dog is all wet, too. And uh, basically, it started out as an attempt to control the mind of man using electromagnetics. It succeeded, but it didn't succeed. And uh, basically, it evolved into a time project. Because it was discovered that when you finally got enough energy to crash down right to a small point in space, you can literally create a space-time warp, and by controlling it, if the person in the chair had time capability, 
that machine could open a portal to different places and times. Okay, uh, let me ask you this. Uh, when you were in the Montauk project, you obviously had to go into that underground base on Montauk, right? Yep. And you were dealing with, uh, well, I guess Albelic to some degree? Mm-hmm. Okay. And and, and, he, and Yeah, and Duncan. And uh, and Duncan was the one who sat in the chair, correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he was and, the psychic that would go into the trance and concentrate on one thing. Okay. His conscious mind would be deferred somewhere else. Okay. And when, uh, well, let's say, first of all, say that Albelic has, has recently passed on. Isn't that right? Yes. Uh I guess about six months ago. Okay. And have you, were you in touch with him right before he left? No, I could never get through to him on his cell phone. He picked up the cell phone and I don't think he understood me. Okay. Uh, do, do you happen to, have you had any, um, you know, you're putting yourself into some kind of alternate reality, it sounds like, in your studio over there using sound and, uh, and, and creating a vortex, as you said, and so on and so forth. Um, have you tried to uh, connect with him? Yeah, I believe I have. You have? Mm-hmm. Okay, and how's he doing? I don't know for sure. I'm not sure if he knows what's going on. Really? I've connected, but I've not been able to get much information through either way. Okay, how do you know you're connected? I said I believe I am, I'm not sure. Okay, but, but is there are there indications, like in other words, do you see an image? Sort of. Okay. Um, are you using mostly sound or are you using mostly visuals or both? Both. Both, okay. Um, back in the days of Montauk, would you, the technology you're using now be similar to that, to what was used back then, or are you on a whole different level at this point? Well, what we were using back then was based purely on electromagnetics, and what I'm using now is based upon quantum physics and sound and some electromagnetics, but not like it was a Montauk. Okay, so what's the difference between using primarily electromagnetics and versus, say, quantum physics that you're using now in sound? Oh, it's more subtle. Oh, yeah? Is it better? You know, is it, do you feel it's more sophisticated to be using the quantum? Well, with this as I have it now, I can control what's going on. The adept in the Montauk chair really had no control over what was going on. Really? Yeah, the adept in the chair wasn't aware consciously of what he was doing. Oh, that's interesting. So, that, do you remember when, uh, when Duncan Cameron created the, Mo the Montauk monster in his mind? Yep. Okay, and, and then it actually took form and, and destroyed, I guess, at least some of the base, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, so he had no control over that. No, because he went into he goes into a trance where his conscious mind is deferred into another part of his mind structure. Okay. And what becomes a conscious mind is uh, a hypnotized state, I guess if you want to call it that, where he's told what to concentrate on and his entire mind, except for the small piece of his conscious mind, concentrates on what he's told to concentrate on. So he's not in control of it. Okay, the what difference is, is I'm in control of what I'm doing here. I hear you. But but back in those days, was the computer in control or was a human other human in control? Other people were in control. The computer just translated. Okay. And were those humans or were they uh, ETs? No, they, they were humans. Okay. And were, do, you, do you know who was in control? I'm not sure. You're not? <clears throat> okay. Um, did you feel that your life was threatened uh, because as a result of being in that project? Yeah, it's been threatened a number of times. 
but you survived. Mm-hmm. So why do you, you think... You can't get rid of me that easily. <laughs> okay, well, why do you think you survived? Were you protected? But was some, were some people protecting you, or...? Oh, undoubtedly. Think so? And what about Al Bielik? Do you think that, in other words, Al Bielik had, you know, I, I met him, uh, and, and he had a lot of um, sort of very negative entities that would follow him around. I don't know if you're aware of that. Yes, I am. Okay. Because, uh, you know, I'm an intuitive, and what would happen in his presence is there would be a lot of... Uh, well, first of all, scalar weaponry uh, operational, but also there seemed to be a very, it was very, very cold. And I, I sat and had, uh, while he was being interviewed um, way, this is quite a long time ago, um, by Paula Harris, if you remember her. Ooh. And uh, it became colder and colder and colder in the room while he was being interviewed. Yeah. Did you ever experience anything like that? Yes, I have. Okay, uh, so in in terms of protection, do you feel that um, he do you feel, feel that he was being protected, or do you feel that he was not being protected? He was partially protected. Okay. Uh, now, what about um, Peter Moon? What, how do you, how, are you still in touch with Peter? Oh yeah. Okay, that's good. Um, now, as far as what was going on in terms of the time travel element. First of all, did you ever meet David Anderson? Yes, I met Dave, sure. Oh, okay. And, and, and do you feel that he's on the right track with his time travel research? Well, for what he wants to do, he is. <laughs> he doesn't want to build a time machine. He's, he's interested in you know, practical applications of time manipulating technology. His idea is to take out a heart for transplant, put it in a field that slows down time so you have more time to move it. Oh, right. Very sort of medical applications. Well, that's one of them. Uh-huh. Okay, now what is it that you want to do? What, what you seem to want to do is go into alternate realities. Am I right? Well, basically I'm, I'm using alternate realities. See, starting in when I was 60, you know, when I moved up here, my life transitioned from <clears throat> being an engineer, scientist, technical person to going more into spirituality. I am a uh, Native American Indian, and I'm going into that style shamanism, and I'm using my new technology in connection with that. I'm considered to be a technical music musical shaman for modern times, you know, for problems with modern times. And so, that's basically the bent that my life is now taking. Okay, that's very interesting. Uh, so are you, um, in a sense, you know, how music has, has healing vibration? Are you oh, yes, trying to do... Totally. So you're trying to do some healing as well with, uh, with, oh, with sure. your sound? Okay but we only market musical meditation or vision questing. Okay. I, um, I do yeah. not make any claims for healing aspects whatsoever. I understand. <laughs> okay, I totally I'm understand. Good. Yeah, for sure. But it is well known, even in the medical field, that music does have quite a healing aspect if you reproduce what is known as full-spectrum music. Or to be healing, you've got to have the bass reproduced exactly as it was recorded. Because the healing aspects is more in the bass response than the mid-range and treble. Interesting. You have, yes, to go, you have to be able to go from at least 20 hertz or cycles all the way up to 20 kilohertz. What, uh, well, uh, have you heard about the, there, that there's a difference between what's called the Fibonacci uh, sequence and, um, and, and, a, and another uh, sort of form of, of sequential? Do you know what well, I'm talking about? that's all part of uh, sacred mathematics. Uh -huh. So are you using any particular, um, I guess, um, musical 
I don't know. Do you happen to know, you know, Dan Burish was also working in this area? Mm -hmm. you, um, were you familiar with some of the stuff he was doing with the Lotus Project? Yeah, I have some of the CDs. I see. Um, is there any difference in su certain musical tonalities that you found in, in terms of healing sequences? Well, first of all, I do not use generated tonalities, artificially generated tonalities. I've been using basically classical orchestrated music. Because when you start playing with artificially generated tonalities at the level I am, it, it, we, we, we've had some problems doing that stuff. What kind of problems? I won't go into that, but we've All had right. some problems. <laughs> where can, you, can you warp space-time using sound? Say again? Can you warp space-time using sound? Sound and light you can. So you need light as well? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, do you use crystals at all? Yep. You do. So are you using crystals or silicon, you know? Okay, we're going to sort of a break here, and we'll be right back with Preston Nichols. Hi there, this is Carrie Cassidy, Project Camelot with Blur Radio, and we're talking to Preston Nichols. Preston, are you yep. still there? Yep. Okay, very good. So, may I ask you this? Did you do some experiments with Al Bielik, uh in the last few years before he died? No, I didn't. So you, you guys weren't able to work together at all? No, we weren't. How about Duncan Cameron? What, what's he, is he still alive? Yes, he's alive, yeah. Okay, are you still in touch with him? Mm-hmm. You are? Yep. And are you able to work together with him at all? No, he's going on his own path. I see. Uh, so when the things that you're investigating now, do you have the help of, uh, of the government, or are they trying to, uh, in other words, do they interfere with you, or are you able to go your own way? Well, I'm going my own way. And yes, they do try to interfere. Okay. Uh, have what I mean? Have you what? What are you actually trying to do now that that wasn't let's say wasn't done back in the days of Montauk? Well, basically, I'm going into genetics and age regression. Okay. How are you getting into genetics and age regress, regression using quantum physics and sound? Well, let's see. Sound can be used to modify the DNA, the genome. This is why you have to be very careful what sound you're using. Okay. This is why I'm using all natural functions. Because very you interesting. Because you know that stuff will destroy anyone. Okay, and are you familiar with the chakras? Mm-hmm. And so you must be using the sound uh, in connection with the chakras, right? Well, right now, I'm trying to learn how to pick out the genetic signature using music. Okay, and have you had any luck? A little bit. I see. Okay, well, it, I mean, that's great that you're doing that. I think that's fasc fascinating. Uh, if you use crystals, you use them... Uh, I'm not sure how you use them, but are you using them as a focus point? No, I'm using them as a quantum amplification over the transformers and the amplifiers. Oh, so, so to amplify. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with um, Otis Carr? I've heard of it. But, well, he, he's somebody who worked with Tesla. At least that's what he claimed. I don't know for sure. That's true. Uh, have you... Well, it sounds, uh, do you even know, you know, I'm from Project Camelot. Are you familiar with Project Camelot? No, not really. Okay, well, I did an interview with someone named Ralph Ring. Have you ever heard of Ralph? Mm hmm Okay, well, he, he worked uh, with Otis Carr, and they created a craft back in the 60s mm -hmm. that actually was, and it was shaped like a flying saucer and actually did, do, you know, he time traveled. 
and he has evidence of having done that. And one of the things that Otis Carr, who is quite a brilliant man, and his writings are available in case you were interested in reading them, but at any rate, one of the things he told them to do, and they were using crystals in that craft, is to, to um, mentally concentrate on the, the visual spectrum of aquamarine. Mm -hmm. And are you familiar with the powers of different colors in mm -hmm. concert with uh, sound and, and, and crystals? Yeah. You are. Are you working with that at all? Some extent. I see. Uh, have you been able to go into, say, the fourth dimension? Mentally, yes. Physically, no. Okay. Uh, what about any other dimensions? Well, I believe, I can't prove it, but I've already traveled up to the reality that uh, the being we call God is in. Okay. So that would be several <laughs> dimensions well, beyond. I'm sorry? Quite a few realities beyond. I see. And when you're in those other realities, do you want to talk about what your experiences have been? Well, that's very interesting to go into what I'm calling the seventh level or the seventh domain. Because yeah, I, I had to have something to eat right away because I was starting to lose blood sugar. So I apologize for sounding like I'm eating and talking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but basically, the discovery is there's basically two critters that we could call God. You have basically the God of Christ, which is love, light, peace, happiness. Then you got the God of Abraham, which is a little bit on the nasty side. One is known as Tabor, that's the god of love, and the other one is known as Ra. And when I studied the Bible as a kid in Catholic school, you know, we, we had catechism, I used to wonder, why is the Bible have two lines, you know, two storylines in it? The Old Testament is uh, the wrath of God. God wants you to sacrifice then you get into the New Testament, where the being we know as Jesus Christ appeared, and all of a sudden it turns into love and light. I know That's why. Right. There's basically two of them. There's the God of Abraham and the God of Jesus Christ. Well, God might be a, a, a bit of an elevated term for the, uh, the wrathful one, in my opinion. Uh, that, that could also be called the Anunnaki. You know, I'm wondering, is it the negative side and the positive side of the same being? Okay, well, that's one way of looking at it, possibly. However, you know, well, this gets into a phil philosophical argument on what I the know, Bible really know. is. You know, but the Bible is, is written words by, uh, that, that are written by man, and uh, also it's been... Well, it's been heavily messed with over the centuries, as I'm sure you're familiar with. Mm -hmm. And there is, uh, there's evidence that uh, what we on Earth call God is actually just uh, the, the Anunnaki. And that the current incarnation of, of humans is only uh, one of the seedings of humanity. That we've actually been here a number of times and that this time around the so-called ruler class of the planet was this group that, uh, well, Sitchin spent a fair amount of time talking about the Sumerian tablets revealed right, to right, be the Anunnaki. So, but, but that's all very interesting. So you've been traveling in these realms and you've been trying to put this, the pieces together, right? Yeah, right. Okay. Uh, and have you, do you happen to meet with any um, Native American groups? Yeah, I do, sure. Okay, and which which tribe are you affiliated with? Mohawk. Oh. Mohawk and Montaukett. <laughs> okay. Um, and, Mohawks and, are upstate New York Native Indians, and Montaukett sure. is the east end of Long Island. Absolutely. And they're two uh, different groups. The Montaukets look very Egyptian. And Interesting. The, uh, 
the Mohawks were quite Nordic. Really? Yeah. Okay. Um, so when, when you were back in the days of the Montauk Project, were you aware that they were using the Kundalini energy of children to power yeah, the machine? That, I was because I was involved in that. Okay, and how were you involved in that? I was the guy that after the Montauk boys were torn apart and each part programmed for different things, it became my assignment to put them back together again. But you weren't a psychologist. Put into public. Hmm? But you weren't a, a trained psychologist, right? You were an engineer. Well, I started out in psychology. You did. And I don't want to offend anyone in the psychological field, but when I got to the point that they were analyzing the mind using statistics, I said, that's the biggest bunch of malarkey I ever heard. At that point, I knew the quantum model was a better model, but the school I was going to wouldn't teach it. So at that point, uh, I went into electronics and studied the quantum model of the mind on my own. Okay. This is probably what got me into the Montauk project. Who, well, who was it that recruited you into the project? I'm not going to name any actual people. All right. Uh, were there any ex-Nazi uh, scientists involved? Well, this is something how Bielik talked of a lot, but I didn't see many of them. Okay. Um, what about... I, I, I don't know if uh, you would say there, there was a Dr. Von Neumann that was involved? Yep. Okay. Um, it, it he, was, he was purely a physicist and a mathematician. Mm -hmm. So when they were doing their experiments, do you know what they were trying to do when they actually went into, um, well, they went through, they tried to time travel. Where were they going? Do you know? Yeah, there was a lot of work going to Mars and other planets, and they were going back in time. Okay. It looked like were they the trying to... It looked like they were trying to influence World War II. Okay, but this... The Montauk Project happened, let's see, it, well, it ended in 1983 it, that I'm aware of, right? Although it looks like it went on, but I wasn't that involved with it. Okay, but... But when did it start? What approximately? What year was it? 1945? No, it actually started in the late 60s, about 67 to 68. Okay. So I first ran into the Brookhaven National Laboratory. Oh, I see. Did you guys ever go out to Los Alamos? No, I was. I went out to Sandia. Oh, you did. That's where basically I did my uh, work on quantum electronics was at Sandia. That's why there's no records of most of my degrees. Okay. Um, when, okay, so, so they were going into, uh, first of all, you said they were going back in time. You think they were trying to influence World War II, which had already happened. So mm -hmm. what was their objective at that point? Well, close as I could gather on that, is that before we influenced World War II, Nazi Germany won it. Okay. And then when we influenced it, what happened? Then the Allies won it. I always thought that the Allies winning was kind of a, um, a massaging of the, of the sort of scenario. I mean, what seemed to have happened was there was almost a merging. In, in other words, because the Nazis really came over to the U.S. and took, basically took control eventually over here. So okay. in a sense, one would say that they still are, I mean, Jim, I, I don't know if you know Jim Mars, but Jim Mars would say, you know, they're, they're alive and well and, and, fully operational. In fact, the Bush family is still running the country. Mm-hmm. Another group says the country is being run by aliens. Well, I would say behind the Bush cabal are aliens, but they're service to self. Right now, this country is being run by greed. Your <laughs> greed. Okay, well, that's, that's one of the most basic levels, sure. 
Um, now, in terms of this time travel and going into Mars, do you think that they were able to contact the Anunnaki when they did this? At that time, I didn't know. What do you so think? We meant? have been in touch with the Anunnaki. Okay. And are you aware of the Clark McClelland um, sort of testimony that talks about, you know, this very, very tall spaceman that's, do you remember that? Mm-hmm. So that, that was an Anunnaki, right? Say again? That was an Anunnaki that was supposedly Clark McClellan always said that he saw this uh, very large, tall being instructing a couple of our astronauts on a television screen. Mm-hmm. That was that was. Well, if the beings he's talking of were almost like black Africans, yeah. I see, and but they were very tall. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, so that when they went to Mars, and I'm not sure where else, do you think that they were going into the fourth dimension in order to to make contact? No, they were. It was all in this dimension. Okay, and and did. In other words, were you involved in that part of it? Did you go yourself in your own, I don't know, physically or mentally? No, I didn't. So, and, and who did? I mean, I know Duncan Cameron powered the, tr the chair, but, but who actually went? A number of people went. Anyone that we know of? Are, are these people known or not? Well, Sue Swerdlow went. Okay. Um, and are you in touch with Stuart? No, I'll probably see him in a couple of weeks. Okay. So that's... I haven't talked to Stuart since 9-11. Oh, really? Um, well, that should be a very interesting experience for you guys to get back together. Well, we'll see. <laughs> okay. Um, so do you know that how they went to, when they, when they did time travel, did they go through a kind of a vortex or tunnel? Mm-hmm, yep. They did? Mm -hmm. And were you able to see it in operation at all? I saw it on uh, TV monitors. You did? What did you see? Well, there was this room that was about 30 foot square, and the, the particle accelerator would be started up, being fed by the information from the amplifiers and the transmitter, and when the accelerator got close to the speed of light, the magnetic coils would focus it right down the center in the middle of this room, and you would see like this whirling distortion starting at the edge of the room, going down into the middle, going to a point in the middle of the room. Sometimes it was off-center. And then you'd see this hole in the floor open up. Okay. And then what would happen? Oh, the people that were going to go through it would jump into it. They jump into the hole. Okay. At that point, what what would you see them disappear, or would you follow? Would were you able to follow it? Did they have? I don't know if they followed them with cameras or what. We were able to follow them pretty much to the zero point. And then after the zero point, what happened? Well, at that point, they would be re-expanding into physicality in a different space and time. Right. But could you, you, know, you would no longer see them at that point? No, we wouldn't see them here. Okay. Were they able to ever bring anything with them? Mm-hmm. They were. So they could bring a camera, for example. Well, that's how we know what happened on the other end. Well, because you also know by testimony. to the people and uh, cameras that they recorded after they got through the zero point. Okay, so, so that's interesting. So not only the humans would go, but were their bodies dematerializing, then rematerializing? That's what it looked like. Okay, and, and would, so the same process would be happening with something physical like a camera, right? Mm-hmm, yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, at the zero point, everything is, matter is literally deconstructed, and it's a frequency pattern that goes through the zero point, and then the vortex spinning opposite reconstructs the matter based upon the frequency transform that's coming through the zero point. 
And did you have anybody get stuck over there? Yeah, yeah people were lost. Cause, uh, they, only I, let me, they only let me go fuel a couple of times later on when they knew it was working. It was the most so you, scary thing I ever went through. It was, it was like you're dying and then being recreated again. So you did go in, in there? Twice. Where did you go? I basically, once I went back to the forest fires on Long Island in the, uh, I guess it would be about 96, 97, 95. And then another time I went back to World War II. Okay, the forest fires on Long Island, what do you mean 96 or 90? Sorry, are you talking in 1990 or 1896? 1990. Okay, that would have been forward at that time. Yes, yes, I went forward. Okay, so you went forward to forest fires on, on Long Island, and then you and also I went have, backwards. I have videos of myself at a younger age, <clears throat> you know, working with the forest fires on Long Island. Okay, but... When it got to 1990, did you work with forest fires, or was that another parallel reality of you? No, the forest fires were real. No, but what I meant is, you know, when you can't, you live, now lived through 90s, you know, if you time traveled there in, in advance, when you got there in real time, in the time that we know now, did you do that, or was that another part of you? No, who was with me. So you fought forest fires. That's one of the ways. That, that's one of the ways I got in trouble. How did you? What After you mean? I saw myself on the local news, I went looking. You went looking for myself. Okay, so when you say you got that's in trouble, when the powers of be got very upset. Okay, is that back in the nineties when you went looking mm -hmm. for yourself, or did you yeah. go looking for yourself recently? No, in the nineties. Okay, and why did they get upset? They didn't want me meeting myself out of the past. I see. And did you, were you able to? Uh, I'm not going to go into that. Okay. Uh, why wouldn't they want you to meet yourself in the past? Because they've been trying to discredit everything I've been saying, and I might have got proof of it. Oh, I see. Okay, well, uh, do, you, do you recognize that there are parallel realities? Yes, sure. Okay. And so I guess what I was asking is, do you think that you went into a parallel reality when you went forward or backward into time, or do you think that you stayed on the same timeline? Well, in this case, it was the same timeline. Okay. And what about, you said you also went forward, what did you, you said you also went backward to World War II? Mm-hmm. Where, where, where did you find yourself then? I was in Germany. Okay, and were you a soldier, or what was your role? Uh, I was a scientist. In Germany? Mm-hmm. Okay. I was a scientist, and I really from, can't go any deeper into that either. Oh, um, okay. Can you say what country you were from in that life? Well, I was from the U.S. So you were visiting the early scientists? 80s. Okay, but the World War II happened, you know, in the 1940s. So yep. when you went, yep. okay, so are you saying that you were time traveling into that time as a scientist? Mm-hmm. Yep. In Germany? Mm-hmm. Do you think that Germany, in other words, the Germans were working with time travel, do you think that they made a lot of advances with the Nazi bell? Well, they had the the sound and, uh, you know, the sound and light time travel device. The bell was something else. Okay, well, tell me about the bell, because I I've actually been there. I really cannot go into that. But it's quite fascinating, isn't it? Well, I'm not going to go into that. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I understand. Uh, did you happen to see the movie Contact with Jodie Foster? Mm-hmm. Do you think that the device that they showed in the movie was accurate at all? No, it wasn't. Okay. Um, did they happen to go to the moon when they were time traveling in Montauk? Yes, we went to the moon. Okay. And at we the went time, to every planet in the solar system and every moon. Really? Yep. Awesome. 
Well, um, can you tell me when you went to the moon, what I race? I didn't go to the moon. Okay. Well, when they went to the moon, what did they encounter? I don't know. I wasn't privy to all that. Oh, you weren't. Oh, but you know that they went to all the planets. Mm-hmm. Okay, we'll be right back. Uh, thank you so much, Preston. We'll be right back with you in just a few minutes. Hi there. This is Carrie Cassidy from Project Camelot with Blower Radio. And we're talking to Preston Nichols. And we are, well, time traveling, basically, with our minds. Uh, Preston, are you there? Yep. Okay. So you were saying that the device was not the same as what was seen in the movie Contact with Jodie Foster. No. And, okay. <laughs> now, well, see, that, um, had a, that had a vehicle that actually traveled, the person traveled into other times and spaces. Right. The, the machine stayed at Montauk Point. I understand. This person went through like a tunnel to get to another space and time. Okay, um, so, well, you're saying Parson. Mm-hmm. Um, you're saying the person? Yeah, the person at Montauk would go through like a tunnel. Okay. Did you... The um, right. I understand With that. The Jody Foster thing, they had this wild-looking, you know... Uh, shake device that fell down through this ring right. and the person in the device traveled. The device traveled and brought the person there. Well, they used counter-rotating uh, Yes, you know. I know what they used. Yes, so would you say but is that, does that even you know, make sense or does that not make sense to do that? Yeah, that does. Really? See, that movie was based upon another project. Okay, that was there... Was a, not that movie was not based upon the Montauk Project. Okay, was it based on the Philadelphia Experiment? No, it wasn't. Okay, because the Montauk Project was kind of building on the Philadelphia Experiment, wasn't it? Sort of, yep, sort of. Uh, okay. Um, I don't know, are you familiar with Sean David Morton? Yeah, I've met him a number of times. Okay. Uh, do you happen to know that he wrote, he wrote a book uh, that was based on the testimony of a whistleblower who died a couple of years ago that it goes into depth about black projects and uh, time travel? Did you happen to read that book at all? No, I haven't. Okay. Um, I believe it's called Sands of Time. And it has in it some very, very interesting information about time travel and how our government has been using that and how we've yeah, been the visited. Has been. No question. Okay, and it also talks about how we've been visited or the government, you know, certain individuals in the government have been visited by some, some, some individuals who have wanted to, uh, let's say, influence our time. Yeah. And that they themselves were time travelers. So what else is new? <laughs> okay. So you're familiar with this? Oh, yeah. Have you ever met a time traveler? Like, I, I believe we're all time travelers. But have you ever met somebody who is in the sense that he, they came from another time and they were in this time? Oh, well, yeah, a number of times. Okay. So you and met myself out is still the future. I understand. Um, well, yes, and that, that is a uh, very fascinating... And then you get these function. people coming in from the year 5,000-something, five, 5, you no, know, 2,500-something. 2,500, okay. That, that call themselves the wingmakers. Right. Oh, so I didn't dream that one up because I got technology and concepts out of it that I didn't have. And are you familiar with the website called The Wingmakers? Yeah, it has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with that. But you oh, Well, the caves in Chaco Canyon uh, does exist because I've seen the caves. Okay, so that there is some grains of truth there, right? Yeah, there is some truth. Mm-hmm. Okay, and, and... These guys come from 2750-something, 2755... 2750 to 2760, they project themselves in, and they say, I or we represent a group you know as the wingmakers. 
Right. And 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 so you you've interacted with these beings. Yes, I have. Okay. And what do you think of them? I actually like them. Okay. Do you think they're positive entities? Oh yeah, they're, they're, they seem to be positive. They're much more positive than the Zardanian order is. <laughs> uh, and and I'm sorry, the Zardanian order you said? Yeah. And who are they? That's another group out of the future, another possible future that on the surface looks very positive, very nice, but uh, the people in that possibility are totally controlled by a small group of people or a small group of aliens, whatever they are. I see. Is that a future Earth or from another planet? No, that's a future Earth. Oh, is it? Okay. And they're called the Zardanians? Mm-hmm. Interesting. What do they look like? They look human. Oh, they do? Any difference at all in their physicality or their, their height or any, anything else? No, they look pretty much like modern-day humans. Okay. And so do the wingmakers, whoever they are. The wingmakers also look human. Yeah. Okay. Um, are, did you ever meet, for example, any um, Pleiaran, Pleiadians? Yeah. Uh, Quite often. Quite often. Okay. Quite often. And did you think that they were positive beings? They seem to be. Okay, and what about the Nordic? Well, if you read my book, The Encounter in the, Plea in the Pleiades, I believe that I'm a Pleiadian soul in a human body. Oh, you do? Okay. I think that I did read that, um, but it's been many, many years. I should probably go back and read it again. Uh, but at any rate, do you think that, um, well, let's say, let's, let's talk about the reptilians and the greys. What do you think that they're doing here? I really personally don't have much of a clue. Okay. But you're aware that they are here, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Have we you had encountered... A reptilian. We had a reptilian at the Montauk Project. Mm-hmm. I used to work next to him, although we didn't have much contact in actuality. And we also had the Grays. Oh, yeah, definitely. I believe that. Um, well, as far as the, the, the reptilians as, well, there are many reptilian races, which I assume you know, um, do you feel that they're influencing events right here on Earth at this time? Well, I'm not in a position to really know. Okay, but you seem to have delved into all kinds of areas, so you must be interested, or are, are you interested in who's ruling the Earth at this time? Yes and no. I am interested, but, you know, there isn't much I can do about it personally. I see. Okay. Um, huh. Okay. Would you, would you tell me if you, what you encountered, for example, on the various other planets or what, what they, they encountered on those planets? For example, Phobos. Did they have any information of what they experienced in Phobos? In where? Phobos. I don't know. You don't know. Okay, is there any information that you got, Jupiter, Saturn, you know, any, any tidbits I of guess information? the most I got was uh, Mars. Okay, and, and what did that you get? I was working with a number of people that went to Mars through the project. Uh-huh. And... But the Montauk boys have been all over the galaxy, all over the solar system. Okay, and one of those boys was Stuart Swerdlow, for example. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, and what about want the Lars. What about Montauk girls? Well, this is a topic which I never got involved with. <laughs> this is something that Peter Moon uh, likes to say that there were women. There were a few, but generally the women were sex objects. Uh huh. Okay. Um, it was a very male-oriented project, the Montauk Project. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let me ask you this. Did you, when they went to Mars, what time period did they go to Mars? Different time periods, or did they just go, like, to the current time period, or? 
So you know? the current time period that they went to a colony on Mars. And was it a human colony? Mm -hmm. Yes, it was. Okay, and was was there a, a mixture of uh, of ET and human in yeah, this there colony? Was. Yeah, okay. there was. Um, and do you happen to know what ra what races of ETs were there? No, I don't. Uh huh. Okay. Um, have you heard of our witness called Henry Deacon? Hmm. Henry. Deacon. No, I haven't. What about uh, a guy? His real name was Arthur Neumann. No, I don't know him. Okay. I've been out of the conspiracy field, I would say, for the last uh, 12, 13 years. Yes, I'm sure you have. I'm not surprised about that. Um, well, we that's have a witness. I, that's when I went from conspiracy and working in technology to my own spirituality. I see. Okay. Um, let me ask you if, if you have... In other words, at that time, did they go to 2012 at all? Did they time travel to this time? As far as I could tell, that whole period from the mid-80s through to uh, the 2000s were pretty much blacked out. I never knew why. Interesting. Okay. Um, so when you, you said 2000, but this is 2012, what about beyond 2000? Well, they attempted to project through 2012, and they would get into uh, spotty times. You know, there was no uh, cohesion in the traveling after that. That's all of a sudden you project and you'd be in the year 6,000 something, or you project and you might be in the year 3,000 something. Okay. And there was very poor control. There was one point in 6,000. 37, I think it was, that they could get to with uh, quite a bit of repeatability. And that was the that was where the dead city was that had that uh, monument in the center of it shaped like a horse. And no, there was a clock in the belly of it. That that's artistic license of the illustrator for my book. <laughs> Okay. Um, did the did the horse look like uh, the drawing on, well, or the painting, whatever you want to call it, on the on the book, or did it look different? I never personally saw it, so I don't. Oh, know you never sure. did. Okay. Did anyone try to draw it at the time back in those days? Well, there were a number of uh, people that did see it. That uh, Peter Moon's wife. Uh, you know, talk with to make up that drawing. Oh, I see. There was it, no clock in the belly of the horse. Right, but did they take any pictures of, of the Montauk horse back in those days? No, I never saw any pictures. If they did, they never showed them to me. See, all these projects are very compartmentalized. Right. And I wasn't in a high enough position to see everything, to know everything. I was basically involved in working with the old radar equipment and setting up the transmitters and also setting up the chair receivers. Okay. I was but not really privy to the logistics of it. I understand. But you also did say that you... Now my logistics knowledge comes from working with people and helping people deprogram that's where most of the logistic knowledge of the project I had came from. So after the fact kind of yeah, information. After the fact. Mm -hmm. um, did you happen to find out whether or not, you know, there's a big deal uh, about the end of the year, 2012, December 21st, around that time, there's a lot of talk about a certain event horizon happening uh, as a result of a certain amount of factors. First of all, moving into alignment with the galactic center, et cetera, et cetera. Did, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. Did, did Montauk or did the people involved in Montauk ever come across any information regarding that time? Well, at that time, it looked like our reality ended in 2012. Really? Well, now it looks like, to me, my research, my vision questing, it looks like it goes on to about 2020-something. Okay, but well, how can right you get now, to the year 6,000? Uh, I mean, 
there must be a through line if you're getting to the year 6,000, right? I don't get to the year 6,000. Well, I'm saying they, they, they saw, for example, the Montauk horse in the year 6,000, so that somehow the Earth had to be, or at least a version. I'm not even sure that's Earth. Okay, that's valid. Um, for example, you think that what you, okay, let's, I mean, there's two things here. One is what they saw in the, the days of the Montauk Project. And in the days of the Montauk Project, you said there was some evidence that got to the year 3,000. There was evidence of getting to the year 6,000. Um, I was using that as an example. Uh-huh. But did they get, in other words, you said there was sort of a blacked out time up until the year 2000, and that they, after 2012, it was more or less, you said, sketchy. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, but... Since then, you've been doing some traveling, and you are seeing, are you seeing a, a sort of um, information going up until 2020-something? It looks like right now, it looks like 2023. 2023. And what but are you this seeing? This year, this is going to be the year 2012-2013 of uh, sun problems. They were already having sun stuff. Okay, and can you elaborate on what you've seen for this year and next? Well, I'm not going to make any predictions. Sure. As you go ahead in time, time opens up to a hemisphere of possibilities. Mm -hmm. But what we're having right now is we're having training solar flares one right after another. There are huge magnetic storms on the sun, which <clears throat> some people at NASA Thing could go into a circular, global type corona mass ejection, and okay, that yes. happens. If that happens, we get an EMP that wipes out most of our modern technology on this planet. Okay, and have you tried to sort of go to those time that time and see whether indeed that happens, or are are you sort of not sure? I'm not sure. Okay. Um, and then I project through using certain recordings that witness to the, uh, you know, the horizon of what you're talking of, and that's when I find it's coming around 2023. And back in 2000, it looked like it was 2012, but as we progress towards 2012, that point jumped ahead, and then they jump ahead again. Well, when you said that point jumps ahead, jumps ahead to what? From 2012 to where? First it went to about 2018, then it went to 2020, and now it's 2023. Okay. Um, you know, there. I don't know if you've ever heard of Ashiana Dean. No, I haven't. Okay, well, she has some information from off-worlders that says that we're going to actually jump to the year something like 20, I don't know, 50. And oh, then, that's very possible. And then we're going to move There back. is involved in this a 20-year dead zone in time. Okay. So if it jumps ahead to the 2030s, it could jump right directly to the 2050s. Okay, yeah, could be interesting. Uh, all right, that could so, be very interesting. <laughs> do you, um, you know, in doing what you're doing even now, uh, and, and I'm sure it was different back then, but you can sort of talk about that too if you'd like, what were the physical ramifications of time travel? Well, from the Montauk project, the time projection wasn't stable enough. We were told if we ever met ourselves in the future from that point, don't get anywhere near us. Okay, but no, it was when now, I went and looked for myself in the mid '90s in the forest fires, I wasn't supposed to do that. Right. I was told in the '70s and '80s if I ever came across myself in the future, don't approach myself. Okay, but in terms of the physical ramifications of the time travel you're doing now, do you notice any difference? I don't know for sure. Okay, well, you because said you're going trying to... What's going ahead, there are so many influences. I don't know if anything I've done has had any effect. It could have. 
Okay, well, but you said you were trying to affect DNA, so there's obviously, in other words, you can... Well, that's, you, that, that's a different issue. Well, it's, it can manifest physically, though, right? Say again? If you affect the DNA, it also manifests physically. It can. So, you know how they say that, there, that we have junk DNA, which is actually valid DNA, and that if you can activate those strands, we would eventually get to what we're supposed to be, which is 12 strand and beyond DNA mm -hmm. activated. So y you must be attempting to do that. No, what I'm attempting to do is to clear out the distortion from the continual replication of the DNA in the body. Okay. In that I'm distortion... To return the DNA to about the age of 25 in males, and probably more like 19 in females. Okay. Well, one of the things that we're told is that when the Anunnaki came to Earth, and messed with humans' DNA, um, and this was... They weren't think, the only ones. Oh, absolutely, I understand that. But, but when they did it, what they did is that's when they limited the human lifespan. Well, what they did is they crashed the 24th pair into the 23rd. I see. That's why we don't have 48 chromosomes, we have 46. Mm -hmm. And the wing makers originally told me that, and then it was announced medically, and the medical people said it was the first and the second. So which end do you call the, the 23rd, 24th, or which end do you call the first and second? <laughs> you know, it's the exact same thing. Um, just out of curiosity, have you been following this John Ford UFO case that Peter Moon's involved with? Oh, yeah. I know John Ford very well. Okay. Um, do you he know any... me every Sunday from the loony bin. Okay, do you think that he is loony? He's no more loony than you and I are. Okay, good. Glad to hear it. Um, what about this, uh, this very interesting individual over in, I guess it's Romania, that's involved with the, the, the Romanian discovery somewhere near, the, I guess, what they call the Romanian Sphinx? Right, yeah. Are, are Peter, you, Moon, Peter Moon's working with that. If you want right. to talk about that, you're best interviewing him. I understand, but I just wondered whether or not you had had any, because if you're doing time traveling, you can actually go all, all sorts of places, right? I haven't attempted to even go there. Okay. All right, what about CERN? Have you tried to see what they're doing over there? Oh, I know exactly what they're doing. Do you want to tell us? They're basically trying to create a miniature black hole, which they're, you know, they're going about using a sledgehammer to kill flies. <laughs> so there are much more subtle, easier ways to do it. Okay, so, so you actually believe that mm -hmm. they're trying to do that? And it's very dangerous. Right. But what's the purpose of doing something like that? They're trying to prove the existence of the Big Bang. I know. That's, what the, that's the cover to, story, though. And they're trying to generate a black hole and control it. it Isn't it almost, much more likely that they're trying to actually create a, a sort of a force field around Earth and, and move us into another dimension? There's enough power there to do that. You don't think so? No. It takes much more power than they got in NCERN. Okay. Uh, did did your wingmaker contacts tell you of any kind of invasion happening on the planet Earth? Yeah, sure. Okay. And did they say it was in the future, or did they say when it was going to happen? They say it's in the future. Okay. But how far in the future? Is it soon? I don't. I shouldn't go into that. I see. Okay. Well, how about this idea? Do you, have you heard of the idea that um, Horus is returning to Earth? Yeah, I've heard that. Do you, do you believe that? I don't know. You think it's a possibility? I guess it's a possibility. Okay. 
I was just curious. Uh, now we have uh, we only have about a half hour left to our show, and we're probably going to have a break here pretty quick. But when we come back, what I'd like to do is, is open it up for callers to ask you questions. I'm sure a lot of people have all sorts of questions they'd like to ask. But I'd also like you to tell us anything that you'd like to sort of talk about that I haven't asked you about, but you you know you'd like to tell us about. Yeah. Okay. So and I have, you know, we have gone into what my present-day research is with music affecting genetics and, uh, right. you know, uh, mental travel through the equipment. Uh-huh. But, but, but in terms of what you're doing now and, uh, first of all, I mean, do you have uh, kids? Did you get married? I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know, but are they affected by what you do, you know, your experiments or the, at all? No, I don't have. Okay. I've been a bachelor my whole life. And do you have any friends that have uh, sort of, that, that are your, I don't know, are taking part in your experiments? Some. Yeah? Mm-hmm. So that must be pretty interesting. Well, nothing else, what you get out of the work I'm doing now is we have ways of opening the person's mind up and what it turns out, it's the best thing you could do if you're a performer. You know, when you're being trained as a performer, you're told to reach out and touch the mind of the audience. Uh -huh. And I know exactly how to open a guy up for that. Okay. I've had quite a bit of work doing that. Interesting. All right. Very good. Uh, all right. We'll be right back. Uh, okay. Thank you. Hi, it's Carrie Cassidy from Project Camelot, Whistleblower Radio, and we're talking to Preston Nichols, and what I'm going to do is open it up for callers, and that means that if, uh, if there's anyone who wants to call in, I believe you call, let's see, the, um, if you want to call Skype, it looks like they have a Freedom Screen, which is the Skype name that you can call, or you can dial 347-688-2902. And uh, in the meantime, Preston, are you still there? Yep. Okay, very good. Uh, in terms of the future, are you optimistic? I'm, I guess you could say I'm uh, both pessimistic and optimistic. Okay, okay. well, that makes what, sense. What I see of mankind, <clears throat> I'm not at all happy with. Uh, what's you know most of mankind? Most of mankind is just a bunch of greedy. I don't want to use the terms that I'd like to. Okay. Uh, According to the galaxy being, when we go through what you're calling the event horizon, only about a million of us survive. So, uh, so at that point, we're going to be seven and a half billion. He says. Okay, that would be. You're talking about the end of this year, then? No, I'm talking in the 20s. 2020? Somewhere up around there. Okay. Interesting. Uh, okay, do we have a caller on the line? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Hi, yeah, yeah. sure. Go right ahead. Hey, you know, what's interesting is uh, tonight, at the same time, uh, Duncan Cameron was giving a lecture in uh, uh, New York. And... Uh, I didn't know he was still around. He he was I, I, I watched it on, on a live stream. He was um playing some piece of music, but he played it seven times and each time it sounded different. Do, do you know anything about that? What what that's about? No, I don't. Hmm. And and someone asked him uh, about you and he said you were cloned. Are you cloned? I don't know. <laughs> that's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't how, know. how would you, how would you know? I guess you wouldn't know, huh? I don't know how you would know. Okay. Okay, uh, caller, is that, did you have any other call? Uh, anything else to ask, or, or should we go to the next caller? Go to the next caller, that's fine. All right, thank you very much. So do we have another caller on the line? I, I'm not sure because yeah, I don't. Yeah, 732. All right, uh, so 732, you're on the air with Preston Nichols and Carrie Cassidy. Hi, Carrie and Preston. This is Sharon from New Jersey. Um, Preston, can you tell me, was Project Pegasus running at the same time as the Montauk chair? I really don't know. 
did they bring those um, participants in Project Pegasus over to Montauk to use your chair there? I don't know. Yeah, you, I you don't have to know much about Project Pegasus. That ha that's a project that that uh, basically Andy Bashago is talking about. It's um, it's not something that Preston was involved in. They did the same thing, right, Carrie? Didn't they do time traveling? Well, that's yes, that's the assertion. But that, but again, you know, two different projects, people right. that weren't involved in both. If you understand. Okay. But thank you for the for the question. Okay. Yes, bye. Thanks for the call. Okay. Uh, do we have another caller on the line? Eight oh four. It looks like. Hi, Carrie. Hi, Preston. This is Hi. Catherine. How are you? Oh, I'm um, fine. I, I was listening. I, I just started listening, so I think you're further along, so I hope I'm not asking a question that someone else asked. But my question, I just listened to the question about the clone, and um, I was told that there, you know, people that I met, one person in particular I met was a clone, um, you know, whether you believe it or not. Um, some things made me think it could be true, um, and I'm just curious, like, if you have a clone of yourself, if someone hurts that clone, do you have pain? If you die, do you just go directly into the clone? How does that work, and how does the, um, you know, how does the clone get animated? You know, is it sort of, you know, in a oh, vegetative well, state? Cloning is essentially an old art at this point. A, a what? An old sprite? Uh huh. Yeah, it's a, it's an older uh, thing. They've been doing cloning for years. Mm -hmm. Many human beings have been cloned. Right. They say you know all the all the political figures have been. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And whether I'm cloned, I really don't know. I mean, I think a lot of us could have been, you know, and they and and you know, if people were doing time travel, they could have cloned people, had a clone standing by in case, you know, the spirit doesn't make it back, or if they have them do, um, you know, out of body stuff, which is real dangerous. They could like even kill the person and then just have the clone standing by for them to come back into. It's highly possible. Uh, well, I, I'm not so sure about that. I, I don't think it's quite so simple. I, I think that clones, for one thing, don't have souls, and so that the original um, essence is not in the clone. That, that's the whole point. And therefore, yeah, but what, what I'm saying is, like, if they if they kill the person. T to be able to have that person, you know, go through the tunnel and go, you know, wherever you go when you die and see, you know, the, the astral. If but they kill the person and, and then the have it come back, and then so the clone would be just like, you know, in uh, the movie Avatar. The clone would just be no. the vehicle the spirit goes into, so the spirit would just go into that body. That's not what, you get what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm saying that's not what a clone is. Um, well, then how do they, like, clone all the, the, you know, the presidents and all that? Okay, well, um, cloning is, is maybe maybe Preston knows something about cloning. Cl do you know anything about... I don't about know much about cloning. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and, my and also, so it, 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 it's not the same as the avatar thing. What you're talking about is, is a different thing. It's kind of like soul transference. It's a different mm -hmm. process than cloning. And and can you get Preston to talk a little bit more about, you know, the the whole concept how like they couldn't kill the people in the you know the Montauk project because then it would have messed up the whole timeline. You know, the well, timeline is messed up. <laughs> do you think? Do you feel like it's coming back together? What it's supposed to have been? Do you get that feeling? I don't like? see that. I don't see that. I mm. see it all coming to an end quite soon. Mm. In 2020, you think? Yeah, that's huh. what it looks like right now. Mm -hmm. As we approach that date, it may change again. Mm -hmm. This yeah. is why I will not go into making predictions of the future. Because uh -huh. I know how the flow of time works, and it's almost impossible to actually predict the future. 
Yeah, and it's and it's almost like do you notice how things seem to be going a certain way, and then it's like all of a sudden it shifts, and then mm-hmm. all of a sudden another shifts, and yeah. you know it just it just seems like you can't even plan a day anymore, you know because everything just changes. Mm-hmm. And yes, um, I know. okay, uh, caller, thank you very much for your questions. We mm-hmm. we'd like to give some other people a chance uh, okay, to come on the you. show here. Have a nice but night. thank you, thank you. Uh, next caller is. Uh, I, I'm, I'm actually not sure which I see several 734. people. 734. Okay, 734, uh, you are on the air. Hi. Hi, this is uh, uh, Jason from Ann Arbor. Um, I was uh, interested uh, to get your uh, interpretation of the timeline issue. A lot of uh, the witnesses on here have talked about there being two timelines right now, primary timelines, and one is kind of a disaster timeline, the other one is more positive, I don't know how positive, but more positive, Um, and that they're sort of narrowing down to these two out of many, and yet in the future, or the futures that you see, there seem to be many more timelines than that, and with these time travelers, it seems that they're coming back to maybe make sure their timeline survives or something. So it seems to be a bit of a conflict, and I'm wondering what you think about uh, maybe what's causing the time kind of contraction down to the, like uh, fewer timelines now, and uh, if there really will be two timelines, or maybe we'll just all of us will split off into whatever timeline is appropriate for us, or what you think about that. Well, again, I really don't know, I can't predict, but I have seen two possible futures. One is the good future that you're talking of, which is presented by a group that presents themselves as the wingmakers, although that's not their real name. And the other one is the Zardanian order. And the Zardanian order is the despotic one. And the wingmakers is the, uh, you know, well, with the ring makers, you can have any lifestyle you want. You can live any way you want. If you want to be dominated by a computer, they have that available. If you want to live free in the country, they have that available. But from what I can find out from the Sardanian order, talking with representatives of them, the population in the Sardanian order is totally implanted and totally controlled by a very small group of despots or what appears to be despots to me. Okay. Uh, caller, did, did that answer your question? Um, I mean, it, it, it's kind of an answer. I guess I'm, uh, one thing I wanted to just know about was <clears throat> you said that there's all these people coming back from the future, and they don't seem to be from one of these two timelines that you're talking about in this case or that other people have talked about. So I'm wondering, uh, you know, why are these other uh, people uh, from different uh, timelines, uh, at least that's my impression, coming back? Well, I I mean, let me just say this, and Preston, you can also, you know, respond, which is that, first of all, there's not going to be just two timelines. That's impossible. Um, I think according to physicists even at this time, they acknowledge that there's multiple timelines. So they're not narrowing down to just two. That would be ludicrous. But what is happening is perhaps um, that people are are sort of tending to focus on one or the other uh, to the exclusion of the others. That doesn't mean the others don't exist because there are multiple realities. Yes, there are. There's many realities. Huh? It, it's us that's kind of doing it as a collective, um, you know, our, because we are focusing on the disaster or the good timeline, it's basically our sense of duality that's kind of creating this choice right now. Oh, that's highly possible. Sure, but but I would say that within that, you have to understand that there's going to be multiple gradations of those realities as well, just as there are at this very moment multiple gradations of this reality. So, in other words, I, I think that this is all simultaneously going on. I think it's a matter of, of mental focus that you're talking about, and it, it's selective, and I, I don't think 
um, in a sense, it's a certain prejudice that, that this time has. That doesn't make it true or right. Um, but caller, we're going to have to go on to the next caller. Thank you for your call and your question. Great. Uh, so who is the next caller? If you could tell me what. <laughs> uh, uh, Gerber. 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 Well, Sorry. Well, <laughs> hello, Gary and uh, Revolution Radio. Thank you for uh, letting me ask this question. Preston, I'd like to ask you the question about the time the seven foot man, uh, the seven to, the seven foot uh, beam was uh, next to your office, and you were concocting something for a battery charger, and he came in there. <laughs> He came in there and uh, started drinking your solution and, and got high. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can you explain that to uh, the audience? Apparently, for me? their biology is entirely different from ours, and sodium hydroxide makes them high. And who is this? What what being are we talking about? I don't know for sure what they call themselves, but there is a darn good painting on the net of what this critter looked like. Okay, well, do you know whereabouts on the net? <laughs> yeah, I can, I can tell you that. Okay, that would be cool uh, to know. Wasn't he the boss? Mm -hmm. Wasn't he like an, uh, an advisor? He was kind yeah, of like the, he, was, he was like an advisor. You know, he put on my glasses. I got a picture here of something made by a friend, and when I saw it, I said, my God, that looks exactly like the critter. It is greatdreams.com. Uh, reptilian, reptile, JPG, because you put www and HDTV in front of that. And then right under the little picture is, uh, what is that? I have to put on my other glasses. This isn't blown up to be big. Sort of resembles, uh, remember the Gorn on Star Trek? Yes. It sort of resembles that critter. www.anw.com slash Kesara, K-E-S-A-R-A. I guess that's the artist. And I have one more quick question. Yeah, go ahead. Do you, re do you recall stating that uh, in the stairwell at that place had a, had a smaller rail for the, the three-foot critters? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Thank you caller. Thank Thanks you, very much. Bye-bye. Uh, Bye-bye. Um, is there another caller on the line? And if so, 518, it looks like. Eric code 518? That's right up here. Oh, I'm Hello? sorry. It's a, it's 831. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 831. Eric code 831. Are you there? Hello. 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 Hi. You're on the air with Carrie Cassidy and Preston Nichols. Oh, hi. Um, how are you guys doing? Good. How are you? I'm good. Hello. Um, hi. I wanted to ask you, um, what kind of abilities that the, do those um, wind makers have, or like the people that come from the future? Do they have like any uh, kind of yeah. any kind of abilities? Like, are they able to fly or? Um, no, I haven't seen any of them fly. It's really weird to me. I, I can hear loads, loads of different people here. They look as human as we do, and basically they seem to be, uh, you know, uh, develop paranormally. You know, they have good EMP. Can, can everybody hear me, or is this... Like yes, we can hear you. Oh, I think we have more than one caller on the yes. line. Uh, oh? I, I guess somehow that there's a that somebody should be just doing this individually. I'm sorry. We're talking to area code 831 right now. So if there's another caller on the line, if you could hold on until we get done with this caller, that'd be great. Yeah, I'm, I'm very polite. I'm calling from England now, so... Um no problem. It'll just be a moment here. Uh, so basically, did that answer your question, um, caller from on area code eight three one? Um, I mean, what do you say that that they look just like us? They just have a little bit of paranormal paranormal uh, abilities. Well, oh, they're quite developed paranormally, and of course, they have both groups I met with seem to have a much higher level of technology than we have. Oh, so the, okay, I see. And, and they come from Earth? That's what they tell me. How do, 
Well, when you okay. get these people either approach you from, uh, you That's know, trippy man. Yeah, <laughs> from meeting with you or projecting themselves. You don't know where they actually come from. So at one time they were in on Earth, but they have actually now, now they come from another dimension, a higher dimension, is what I, I believe Preston is saying. It could okay. be. Yeah, because um, by that time the vibrations, the frequency of consciousness, consciousness will be different than more of all. It probably would be. Yeah. So Preston, wouldn't you say that their bodies are a lot finer uh, in terms of physicality? It's they're um, they must be closer to a light body than a, a physical know. body. I don't know. So when you saw them, you saw them in, in, you know, 3D color, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, but you, did you have any physical contact with them? Were you able to figure, figure out what they were composed of? Well, you could touch them like anyone else. I see. And did they feel just like a, a normal human? Mm-hmm, yeah. Okay. So they were taking on a human, uh, they were entering this dimension fully then, at that time? They were entering this dimension fully. What they are, where they come from, I really don't know. Although I did accompany some of the wing makers back to their time, and it, it looked as physical as we are. Hey, Gary. Yes. Um, I would like to mention here on, on live that... Um, I have been visited, contacted many times by the Greys. Okay. Um, so you're I'm not making, the only one. <laughs> I'm not making this up. No, I, I'm sure you're not. Yeah, we were saying I've been conscious. I've been conscious of, like, I, I was actually, uh, like, face-to-face -face with them. Mm -hmm, I know. Di different kinds, actually, different sizes. One of them, one of them really freaked me out. Um, Okay, well, be sure to stand in your own light and, and claim your own sovereignty so that they don't mess with you. Oh, they mess with me all the damn time. I hate it. Okay, but you can take... I, I'm serious. If, if you insist that they, you know, they back up and, and basically you should raise your frequency and, uh, and you'll get to a place where they can't mess with you. Right. Yep. I'm they really to, will. I'm thinking about making orgone because I hear that... Um, and it can be around or like areas where there's orgone. Yeah, well, there's lots of orgone out there. You can certainly even just buy it. Yeah, I can make it. Um, okay, cool. But uh, you, what you best do is you need to outfit your own light body. So meditation yeah. is the only way to do that. I do a lot of meditation actually. Okay, and then also protecting yourself, and also uh, refining your own, you know, karma and making sure that you're putting healthy stuff in your body and so on. Uh, I've been doing that. Cool. And I don't think that, uh, I don't know, it's just weird. And then all <laughs> the elf, and all the elf towers, you know those elf towers? Yes. It's like mm -hmm. burning everyone into zombies. Okay, well, um, thank you very much, caller. I'm sorry, but we, we do need to go to the next guy because he's holding from England. So okay. thank you very much for calling, and um, good luck with all of that, okay? Thank you for having me. Okay, take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Uh, so we had another caller that was holding on the line from England. Are you there? Hello, Kerry. How are you? I'm good. We're here with Preston Nichols. Did you have something for Preston? Um, well, not, um, in some ways, yes. I mean, a lot of the stuff is sort of American-based, so... It, do you have any any feelings about Europe and, and what's going to happen there? Or? Well, Europe is going to be part of the financial crash that uh, is on the horizon. And the financial crash will be worldwide. And whatever happens when we enter the uh, event horizon or the zone, whatever you want to call it, it's the entire planet. So Europe will be in there with the rest of us. And, and what what about uh, other places like South America and uh, it all goes in. Okay, I think what the caller is saying, Preston, is uh, and again, caller, keep in mind that Preston is relating this to 2020, so he's not actually seeing that happen this year, if you will. He says it. I think. Yeah, the, 
it will. I see begin. a million pea this year. You do. Okay. And it's from and, the sun. And what what some people are saying and wondering is, are certain areas of the earth going to be safer that, than others? Do you have a point of view on that, Preston? From the EMP, sure. I know a woman who, um, uh, she's a channeler, and um, 10 years ago she was saying that you, you have to um, live above the 66th parallel to be safe. Yeah, that's the... Who is it? Somebody and, like and she actually, the, the, the woman I knew, uh, her name is Suzanne, she's now right up in the north of Finland, as we speak. Um, it, it's not a place for everybody, obviously. But. Okay, well, there's a lot of mixed uh, mixed information in that regard. Oh, but, yeah. Preston, are you seeing anything specifically in terms of, because my understanding is, in a certain sense, it's a crapshoot. Uh, it's where at whatever side is, is actually facing the sun at the time that the, the EMP comes through, right? Yeah, that's for the EMP, although what can happen if the EMP is strong enough and we get a major <coughs> plasma hit that can actually displace the atmosphere, the EMP can go into the electrojet and get distributed around the entire planet the magnetopause, if the plasma storm hits the magnetopause, that will generate an EMP in itself through, the, again, the electrojet.